This incident took place when I was living in Hachioji while attending university. At the time, I had relocated to Tokyo from Chiba and had already lived in two different places before moving into my second apartment in Tokyo. The moment I laid eyes on this particular apartment, I was captivated. Although the building was quite old, it had recently undergone renovations, giving it a fresh look. What truly stood out was the unique structure and layout of the apartment. As soon as I saw it, I expressed my interest to the real estate agent and eventually signed the lease. I had a girlfriend who decided to move in with me, and I want to provide some insight into the layout of the apartment. It was situated on the second floor of the building, and what made it even more intriguing was the fact that it had its own personal staircase connected directly to the apartment. Below this private staircase, there was a convenient parking spot. Upon entering the apartment, you'd find the toilet on the right and the kitchen further down the hall. To the right of the kitchen, there were stairs leading up to the living room entrance. If you climbed those stairs, you'd reach a door that led to the attic, a feature I particularly liked. So, the floor plan was certainly unusual, but quite appealing. However, shortly after we moved in, strange occurrences began to unfold. My girlfriend was just as enamored with the place as I was. One evening, while we were relaxing in the living room, sipping on drinks and watching TV, both of us heard the distinct sound of the door handle moving. Instantly, my girlfriend went into a panic mode, visibly terrified. In an attempt to downplay the situation, I casually mentioned that it was probably just the wind causing the noise. However, in reality, my heart was racing in my chest. The noise clearly resembled the sound of someone tampering with the door handle, and it happened again a few seconds later. This time, my girlfriend's panic intensified, and she was on the verge of tears. As her boyfriend, I couldn't ignore her distress so I decided to investigate the source of the noise. I reassured her and told her to stay put while I braved the unknown. Walking away from the lounge, I approached the front door with apprehension. What I witnessed sent chills down my spine. The front door handle was moving up and down, as if someone were vigorously attempting to gain entry from the outside. Panic washed over me, as the door handle rattled, and the door itself seemed to be under considerable force. It was then that I realized the door hadn't been properly locked. Just as that thought crossed my mind, the door suddenly swung open. I had anticipated encountering some menacing intruder, perhaps armed with a knife. But to my surprise, there was no one there. The initial fear slowly dissolved and I called out to my girlfriend. Don't worry, it's just some garbage being blown around by the wind outside making noise. I lied to her in an attempt to reassure her, despite the absence of any visible threat behind that door. An unsettling feeling still lingered. It's often the unseen and the inexplicable that invoke the deepest fear. I decided to put the incident out of my mind and resorted to trying to drown my anxiety with alcohol, even though I was not particularly good at handling it. I had a low tolerance and would easily get drunk, often ending up feeling nauseous. On that peculiar day, though I hadn't consumed much, my condition deteriorated rapidly. I began to hyperventilate, my breath quickening, and I felt disoriented. It was as if I were viewing the world through a yellow filter, with everything taking on a yellowish tint. Something was undeniably wrong, and I had a sense that I might faint or worse. My panic grew internally until it became unbearable. Turning to my girlfriend, I gasped for breath and pleaded for her to call an ambulance. She made the call 
and shortly thereafter, the ambulance arrived to take me to the hospital. At the hospital, I was informed that I had experienced hyperventilation, likely triggered by an unknown stressor. My symptoms had already started to subside, and it was baffling, as I was simply at home, sitting around, and hadn't felt particularly stressed anymore. I requested to leave the hospital and called a taxi to take us back home. I was quite concerned about the incident, considering it had never happened to me before. So I called my mom for her opinion. I should mention that my mom had always believed she had the ability to sense the presence of spirits. I, on the other hand, had never thought I possessed such abilities. What she said, however, caught me off guard. She suggested that my experience sounded like the early symptoms of possession, urging me to be cautious. This sent a shiver down my spine. The episodes of hyperventilation persisted, and I learned to manage them better with each occurrence. But I had made up my mind that I didn't want to continue living in that apartment. Something was deeply unsettling there. My girlfriend shared the sentiment as she had also noticed the effect it was having on me. I tried to stay out of the apartment as much as possible, finding activities outside to occupy my time after classes, such as playing the slots occasionally. I was never the same after that strange incident. I lost interest in playing slots after that incident. It had become a strange and unsettling hobby. Instead, I started picking up my girlfriend from her office job and then heading back to our apartment. About a month had passed since the bizarre door incident when one evening we returned to the apartment. As usual, I tried to park in the spot near the stairs that I preferred. However, when we arrived, the parking lot was crowded with people. Among them, I noticed a monk and everyone else was dressed in mourning attire. Bouquets of flowers and lit incense sticks were scattered around. It was an eerie sight, and my girlfriend and I felt a sense of unease. We decided to park in a different spot and approached the group to inquire about the situation. The monk, with a warm smile, responded, Oh, don't worry. Everything is going fine now. Please, don't worry. I was puzzled and asked him to explain further. A woman in her fifties stepped forward and explained that her husband had taken his life in our apartment just a few days before we moved in. I was left speechless. I questioned why they were performing this ritual now. The monk explained that there was a shared belief that the husband's spirit had not found peace. However, with the assistance of the mourners present that day, and the ritual he had performed. They believed that the man's spirit was finally at peace. Despite the reassurances, I couldn't fully trust that the spirit was indeed at peace. What I had felt during those episodes of hyperventilation was a profound and terrifying fear that I did not want to experience again. So, despite the monk's assurances, I decided to contact the landlord and moved out of that apartment. I am relieved to say that the episodes of hyperventilation ceased immediately, and my girlfriend and I now lead a more comfortable life. This story was shared with me by one of my friends who is an avid mountain climber. He's climbed numerous mountains and is part of the same mountain climbing club as I am. He told me about a particular climb where he had to pay a toll for a parking spot. The person collecting the fee also took down his address and information in case of emergencies. On that day, my friend arrived at 8 a.m., much later than his usual schedule. He planned to climb alone and knew that the elevation was quite high. Given the late start, he decided to spend the night at the summit. The person who had collected the parking fee informed him that there was an unmanned cabin at the summit that he could use. My friend preferred that to setting up his tent. He felt that because of this arrangement, he 
really taking their time and savoring the climbing experience. The summit offered breathtaking views, and my friend relished the solitude. The cabin was empty when he arrived, and he decided to make the most of it. He brewed some coffee, gazed out at the natural beauty of the mountains, and enjoyed a picturesque sunset. As evening descended, the temperature dropped and darkness settled in. My friend sought refuge in the cabin where he had brought along some alcohol. He had a drink while preparing his dinner, all the while listening to the radio. After a long day of hiking, combined with dinner and a few drinks, he felt exhaustion creeping in, deciding to get a good night's rest to start his descent early the next morning. He turned off the lantern, and the cabin was enveloped in darkness. Falling asleep was no issue due to his fatigue. However, in the middle of the night, he abruptly awoke to an unfamiliar sound. It seemed as though the door was rattling. This was perplexing, because when he had checked the weather forecast, there was no indication of particularly strong winds for the night. He strained his ears, listening intently, and soon realized that it wasn't the sound of the wind. It was something else entirely. To him, it sounded like the distinct noise of someone attempting to open the cabin door, accompanied by the sound of people moving around in the darkness. He likened it to the sound of someone fumbling for a door handle in the dark. A glance at his watch revealed that it was past 2 a.m., he couldn't fathom why another climber would be attempting the ascent at this ungodly hour, especially in pitch darkness. This mountain didn't connect to others via ranges, and the parking lot required a toll, making it highly improbable for someone to be there at that time. His experience and knowledge suggested that there should be no one else on the mountain. This realization sent shivers down his spine the inexplicable presence of that family had shaken my friend to his core. They seemed entirely comfortable in the darkness, defying all the logical explanations he could come up with. Despite his terror, he kept his eyes closed, silently praying that they would simply disappear. They entered the cabin, their footsteps echoing on the wooden floor as they seemingly searched for something agonizing seconds dragged on as my friend remained as motionless as possible, hoping not to draw their attention. Then, just as abruptly as they had arrived, the mysterious family left without uttering a word, leaving the cabin door wide open. As soon as he saw them depart, he lost consciousness, likely due to the overwhelming fear that had enveloped him. Upon regaining consciousness, he hastily packed his belongings into his bag and began his descent from the mountain. It's uncertain whether he checked to see if anything was missing, but his priority was getting away from that place. He descended as quickly as he could, still haunted by the memory of his eerie nocturnal visitors. He had no desire to encounter them during daylight hours was something about that family that truly terrified him. Upon reaching the bottom, he shared his harrowing experience with the man at the toll booth. He felt it was essential to recount what had occurred. Regardless of how it might make him appear, the toll booth attendant informed him that he had been the only one on the mountain that night, which disturbed my friend even more. He wondered if he had been visited by spirits. The attendant then mentioned that a few months earlier, a family had gone missing on that very mountain, and no trace of them had been found. This information left my friend pondering whether the family he encountered were their spirits, or if the family was somehow still alive, possibly with memory loss or some other inexplicable circumstances. My friend remained convinced 
that the family he had encountered in the cabin were spirits, an experience that he would never forget. Despite his numerous climbs and hikes, he never encountered the paranormal again. On a separate note, when I sleep outside of my usual bedroom, such as in a hotel or elsewhere, I sometimes hear a strange sound, almost like someone sighing or exhaling. It appears to originate from somewhere in the room, yet I can never pinpoint its source. This noise seems as if there's another person in the room with me, and it persists, even with the lights on. Despite my attempts to locate the sound, I've been unsuccessful. It's a peculiar occurrence that I've tried to capture with photos and videos on my smartphone, but I always end up with nothing discernible. Sometimes, in complete darkness, I feel as though there's something present amidst the shadows, though I can't be entirely certain. It's certainly unsettling to feel as though there's something in the room with you, especially when you hear that eerie sighing or exhaling noise. The sensation can be quite creepy and unsettling, causing constant worry whenever you encounter it. Your experience began last September, and it seems to have coincided with your frequent travel for work, often staying in rundown motels and hotels. You initially wondered if these experiences were a result of your imagination, but that changed when you heard the same sound at home one night. At home, you recall coming back late from work, sitting at the kitchen table while eating pasta. The rest of your family was asleep, and your eyes were dry, so you decided to use eye drops. However, as you were sitting there, you heard that strange sighing sound again. Your eyes were affected by the drops, making it challenging to open them immediately. Slowly, you managed to open your right eye just a bit and scanned the kitchen. As expected, there was nothing out of the ordinary. What made this occurrence different was that you had only heard this sound when you were away from home. Now, it had invaded your own living space. Frustration and curiosity prompted you to search for answers. You diligently investigated the source of the sound starting in the kitchen, but eventually branching out to the hallway and the back door area. However, you couldn't pinpoint its origin, despite straining your ears. The sound seemed to be playing tricks on you, as it always led you back to the kitchen. You even left the room and returned to refresh your ears, though you weren't sure if that was even a phrase. Each time you re-entered the kitchen, the sound appeared to emanate from somewhere near the refrigerator. The possibility that it might be a mechanical noise crossed your mind, but you couldn't shake the feeling that something more mysterious might be at play. It's certainly unsettling to feel as though there's something in the room with you, especially when you hear that eerie sighing or exhaling noise. The sensation can be quite creepy and unsettling, causing constant worry whenever you encounter it. Your experience began last September, and it seems to have coincided with your frequent travel for work, often staying in rundown motels and hotels. You initially wondered if these experiences were a result of your imagination, but that changed when you heard the same sound at home one night. At home, you recall coming back late from work sitting at the kitchen table while eating pasta. The rest of your family was asleep, and your eyes were dry, so you decided to use eye drops. However, as you were sitting there, you heard that strange sighing sound again. Your eyes were affected by the drops, making it challenging to open them immediately. Slowly, you managed to open your right eye just a bit and scanned the kitchen. As expected, there was nothing out of the ordinary. What made this occurrence different was that you had only heard this sound when you were away from home. Now, 
it had invaded your own living space. Frustration and curiosity prompted you to search for answers. You diligently investigated the source of the sound, starting in the kitchen, but eventually branching out to the hallway and the back door area. However, you couldn't pinpoint its origin, despite straining your ears. The sound seemed to be playing tricks on you, as it always led you back to the kitchen. You even left the room and returned to refresh your ears, though you weren't sure if that was even a phrase. Each time you re-entered the kitchen, the sound appeared to emanate from somewhere near the refrigerator. The possibility that it might be a mechanical noise crossed your mind. But you couldn't shake the feeling that something more mysterious might be at play. Your search for the source of the sound led you closer to the refrigerator where the sound seemed to be intertwined with the refrigerator's dull hum. You were convinced it was somewhere nearby. In an attempt to gain clarity, you decided to turn on the lights, typically needing a moment for your eyes to adjust to the darkness. However, something unusual happened that night. Your left eye, which you had kept shut while searching, allowed you to see quite clearly in the dark. Even your right eye, initially closed, began to adjust and improve its night vision. After a few moments, you noticed two white dots emerging from the darkness. These dots gradually transformed into the whites of someone's eyes. You were stunned to realize that the pupils of those eyes were dark, almost black. They were focused directly on you. You couldn't help but gasp in shock as you had never experienced anything like this before. As you continued to watch, you discerned the figure of a person. It appeared as though they were bound or tied up, their limbs restrained, and their mouth concealed with tape. The sound you had been hearing was the person's steady inhalations and exhalations through their nose. There was an eerie absence of panic in their demeanor Instead, an aura of hopeless acceptance hung around them. They seemed to have surrendered to their dire situation. The atmosphere in your darkened kitchen was one of profound desolation and surrender, with the rhythmic breathing serving as a haunting soundtrack. You were left immobilized in stunned horror, unable to move or intervene. After a few moments, Although you couldn't ascertain how long, the figure of the bound person began to blur and gradually faded into the darkness. To this day, you remain baffled by why this apparition or person appeared before you. You haven't heard the breathing in your home again, but you harbor a deep curiosity about the mysterious figure and the circumstances surrounding their appearance. As you prepare for another upcoming business trip next week, you contemplate repeating the same steps you took last time, hoping to encounter the bound person again. The mix of excitement and terror lingers as you wonder if you'll ever hear that unsettling breathing again. The unsettling incident occurred not too long ago, on the eve of a national holiday. School was off the next day, which was always a reason to celebrate. However, it was quite late for someone of your age, around 10.30 p.m. At that time, you were in high school. To understand the context better, it's essential to know your family dynamic. Your father had passed away when you were younger. Your mom worked constantly, and you lived with your grandparents. On that particular night, your granddad was out and your grandma was somewhere downstairs in the house. You were supposed to be studying for exams, but your interest lay more in your music at the time. You used to listen to your tunes through a PSP, and you decided to take a break to rest your eyes. You set the PSP down, leaned back in your chair, and closed your eyes for a moment. Upon reopening your eyes, you glanced at your bedroom door 
and noticed something highly unusual. It was the silhouette of a person, a figure that didn't belong to any family member. This shadowy shape appeared to be peering around the door of the room across the hall. The room across the hall was empty, and there was no logical reason for a shadow to be cast in that direction. Initially, you considered the possibility that your mom or grandma had left a window open for ventilation, causing the curtains to move in such a way. However, the way this figure seemed to leer around the door, looking at you, made it highly implausible. It was evident that it wasn't a trick of the light. You continued to observe as the shadow emerged from the spare room and entered the hallway. It appeared fixated on you, and despite the darkness, you could discern that it was facing your direction. This shadowy presence slowly backed off towards the stairs, maintaining its focus on you. Before it could descend the stairs, it simply vanished. Strangely, the figure seemed to be the same height as you, and its silhouette suggested it had the same hair and clothing as you. At the time, it was just you and your grandma in the house. She didn't venture upstairs often due to her hip issues. You were left perplexed by this inexplicable encounter, as there seemed to be no logical explanation for the shadowy figure that had appeared in your home that night. The mysterious encounter in your home left you deeply shaken and with numerous questions. You were certain that it couldn't have been your grandma, as you would recognize her silhouette, and she would have turned on a light or made her presence known in some way. The figure you saw resembling you and lurking in the other room left you bewildered. You pondered its purpose, and whether it was some kind of spirit or shadow person. The thought of what might have happened if you hadn't noticed its presence was haunting. As your brain searched for logical answers and came up empty, your fear began to intensify. You were left feeling horrified and uneasy, especially at the thought of it returning. You avoided going downstairs, last place you saw the figure, and lived in fear of encountering it again. Even as you continued living in the same house, you never saw the shadowy figure again, but the mystery remained unresolved. You briefly considered the possibility of a home intruder, but you didn't think it was likely. If it were an intruder, you believed you would have seen some distinguishing features or clothing. Despite the eerie experience, you chose to keep it to yourself, fearing that your family might dismiss your account and that your mom, already working long hours, would worry unnecessarily. About five years ago, while living with your parents, you had another unsettling experience. You were feeling unwell, possibly with a cold or fever and were lying in bed one morning around 8 a.m. Your mother called out to you before leaving for work, telling you to call her if you got any sicker. Left alone in the house with just your cat, you became frustrated with the cat's constant entering and exiting your room. In an attempt to keep the cat out, you locked the door with a simple bolt lock. However, your discomfort continued as your body felt heavy and cold, and your vision seemed to shake. You couldn't find a better description for the strange sensations you were experiencing. Despite your desire to call your mother for help, something seemed to prevent you from doing so, leaving you in a state of unease and uncertainty. The harrowing incident unfolded when you were feeling unwell and lying in bed one morning. Your mother had left for work, instructing you to call her if your condition worsened. Alone in the house with just your cat, you became increasingly anxious, compounded by your inability to get a phone signal. To your distress, you heard your cat meowing outside your bedroom door, 
emitting a low, unusual ma sound. What unsettled you was that the meow seemed to be coming from a high place, not at floor level, and you couldn't fathom how your cat could be at head height. There was no furniture near the door that could explain this. You stayed silent and avoided going near the door, as something about the situation felt deeply wrong. After a while, you heard your mother's voice, or what should have been your mother's voice. It sounded off with subtle differences in tone and word choice that made it unsettling. Moreover, your mother had only left for work a few hours ago, making her unexpected return seem odd, especially for a non-life-threatening illness. The tension escalated as you felt the presence on the other side of the door intensify. The doorknob violently turned, and the old lock seemed fragile enough to break easily. Your body was tense, teeth chattering you could even see your breath in the cold. However, as suddenly as it began, the presence vanished, allowing you to move again. You reached for your smartphone and successfully called your mother, asking if she had just returned home. She replied that she was still at work, leading you to concoct a story about a bad dream. Your mother returned during her lunch break, and you remained terrified. Tragically, she discovered that your cat had died, lying at the foot of your bedroom door, with no visible injuries or prior illness. The cat had been happily active just hours before. You couldn't help but wonder if the mysterious presence that had tried to enter your room had something to do with the cat's untimely demise, leaving you with lingering questions about the disturbing incident. Son's passing, though he was always a quiet man, but he had many close friends who he had known for years. And after the passing of his son, he completely cut ties with them. Not many people could have blamed him because he had lost his child. I told him that I was really sorry to hear about his son, but he just looked at me confused and then said, thanks, and just carried on walking. I asked him where he was going. He said that he was going to see his son, and he was going to go home, so we walked off in separate directions. That was the last time that I ever saw him again. I really have no idea what he was talking about when he said that he was speaking to Shoda. And I still can't believe that I actually heard the voice of his son that day. It makes me wonder if his son's spirit was still lingering on this plane. And if so, for what reason? I'm not sure if I'll ever know the answers to these questions. And I guess I just have to accept that it was a weird and unique experience to have it makes me wonder about what happens to our loved ones after they're gone, and if they are still around us in some way, but just in a form that we can't see or understand. I don't know what it all means, but it definitely makes me think about the afterlife and the mysteries that surround it. These are just a few of my own personal experiences and stories I've come across in my life, and I hope you find them interesting as for the eerie occurrences you've described in your stories, they indeed raise questions about the supernatural and the unexplained. Many people have had inexplicable encounters or witnessed strange phenomena that challenge our understanding of the world. It's natural to seek answers and meaning in such experiences. Whether these encounters are manifestations of the paranormal or have more rational explanations can be a subject of debate. People's beliefs and interpretations of such events vary widely, and the mysteries surrounding them continue to captivate our curiosity. Thank you for sharing these stories, and I hope you continue to explore and reflect 
on the unexplained phenomena you've encountered. Melt. I still don't know exactly what happened on that mountain that day, but it was a powerful and emotional encounter with a man who seemed to have received a message or closure from his son, even if it was beyond the realms of our understanding. Grief can manifest in mysterious and deeply personal ways. And sometimes, people have unique experiences that bring them comfort or help them process their emotions. It's a reminder that the human experience is full of complexities and moments that challenge our understanding of life and death. I was tired just like any other night, but this particular evening felt different. Little did I know, a grudge was born that day. Now let me give you a sense of the layout. When you're in bed in the loft, if you naturally look out or down, you'd see the entryway leading to the kitchen. Usually, I sleep on my side, facing the entryway. Sometimes, before sleep takes over, an eerie feeling that someone is watching me, staring at me from down there in the entrance. During uneasy moments like that, I try to distract myself by reading or falling asleep as quickly as possible. I turn off the lights to avoid distractions, relying on a small nightlight near my pillow to read my book. However, one night, a deeper sense of unease crept over me. I felt that something was terribly wrong. I heard a noise coming from below, and the lights were off in that area. I listened carefully, and it sounded like someone was exhaling, distinctly like breathing. The moment my mind grasped that I was hearing breathing, I froze in terror. My heart pounded in my chest, and I feared there was an intruder in my home. The room felt heavy, the air oppressive, surrounding me. It was as if the room grew darker, and I felt strange. The breathing sound continued, growing closer. Below the loft, there was a blind spot, but I felt as if I could pinpoint the spot where the breathing sound emanated. Someone was down there, their back against the wall. I shuddered at the thought, drew my shoulders up to my chin, and clutched my covers tightly. It was a tense standoff, and I felt helpless. The feeling of someone's presence wouldn't subside. After a few moments, the breathing sound abruptly ceased, and I thought it was over, that I had imagined it all. Relief washed over me, but then, in that very moment, I heard a familiar sound, a sound I had heard countless times before. It was the unmistakable sound of someone climbing the ladder that leads to the loft. It was as if someone was ascending towards me. I was frozen with fear, unable to move. My mind was a whirlwind of terror and anxiety as I heard the climbing sound. Then clarity dawned upon me. It was fight or flight. I steeled myself to confront whoever was coming up fully expecting to see someone's head emerge any second. Those seconds stretched on, feeling like hours, the tension unbearable, but nothing came into view, and the sound stopped. It halted right at the top of the ladder. If someone had been on that ladder, I should have seen them. It sounded like whatever had climbed up was now in the loft with me. I was utterly bewildered not knowing what was happening. I was certain there was no intruder in the house. As soon as that thought crossed my mind, my nightlight went out, and I was plunged into absolute darkness. Then, near my ear, I heard three chilling words that froze me to my core. Who are you? I can't recall much after that point. I may have passed out from sheer fright. When I finally opened my eyes, it was morning. Strangely, I don't feel a pressing need to seek meaning or explanation for this experience. I'm contemplating whether to move out. It feels
feels like this could be just the beginning of something dark and unsettling. There's undoubtedly something malevolent in my apartment, and I doubt I can bear it if something like that happens again. This story reminds me of something my aunt, who worked in a hospital throughout her career, once told me. When she started as a nurse, she found the night shift to be the most challenging. Her job was demanding. With regular rounds and responses to sudden changes in patients' conditions, adapting to the night shift was tough, as her body was accustomed to sleeping during those hours. But what made it truly eerie was the solitude in the dark hospital at night. As a new nurse, she hoped she would eventually get used to it. However, one night, something strange happened. As my aunt made her rounds along the dark hospital ward, she would check on the patients to see how they were doing. On one particular night, while she was on the third floor, she noticed an elderly man in his 80s sitting upright and staring blankly out the window. The elderly man noticed my aunt standing in the doorway of his room, watching him, and he called out, Is it? Nozaki-san on night duty tonight. He never turned away from the window, but my aunt could see his face in the reflection, and it seemed like he was grinning. My aunt encouraged him to lie back down on the bed and get some rest. It wasn't the first time she had heard someone mention Nozaki-san since she started working the night shift. Patients often spoke positively about this Nozaki-san. With one patient, even suggesting that Nozaki-san was better at her job than my aunt. My aunt was not the type to be envious or competitive. But because patients frequently referred to this mysterious figure, she decided to make an effort to meet them. She searched through the logs and registers, but couldn't find any mention of Nozaki-san on the sign-in sheets that doctors and nurses were supposed to fill out when they began their shifts. As far as she knew, there was no one working on her ward by that name. However, she assumed that there must be senior doctors and nurses she hadn't met yet, since she was still relatively new to her role. After making sure the elderly man was back in bed, my aunt returned to the nurse's station, where a senior nurse was present. They engaged in casual conversation and my aunt used the opportunity to inquire about Nozaki-san. The senior nurse froze for a moment, and an uneasy silence settled over the ward. She then turned to my aunt with a troubled expression and said, Well, it's interesting that you mention Nozaki-san. She used to work here until about a year ago. She took her own life. These kinds of things come up every once in a while. My aunt was deeply unsettled by this revelation, but she hoped it was some sort of misunderstanding. Perhaps the nurse had misheard her or confused her with someone else. So my aunt proceeded to discuss her conversation with the elderly man. The nurse responded with surprising nonchalance, saying, that happens here a lot lately. She had a stony expression as she spoke. My aunt never forgot that exchange. And from that night on, she continued to hear the name Nozaki-san on the ward, especially during her night shifts. It wasn't just the elderly man. Even young male patients and children would mention that name. Every time she heard it, an unsettling feeling washed over her. These patients were... The patients on the ward continued to talk about someone who was no longer there, as if Nozaki-san were still working at the hospital. It felt eerie, as if they could still perceive her presence, as if she had never left. Initially, my aunt was so unsettled by these occurrences that she considered quitting her job. The situation was deeply unnerving. However, instead of giving up, she gradually grew into her role and adapted to life on the ward. With time, that 
uneasy feeling, and the fear she had initially experienced began to wane. While she still heard Nozaki-san's name mentioned on the ward, it no longer creeped her out as it once did. She simply thought to herself, Oh, here we go again. She started to view it differently, considering that maybe Nozaki-san, as a former senior nurse, was still present in spirit, watching over the patients. It didn't have to be creepy. She tried to think of it as a positive presence. As my aunt shared this story with me, I couldn't help but smile, thinking it was a heartwarming tale. Perhaps not all ghosts were malevolent entities. I smiled, and my aunt noticed, nodding at me with a smile of her own. She said, yes, I felt the same way when I came to that realization. It seemed like a comforting notion. However, the story took a darker turn. My aunt went on to reveal something disturbing. She discovered that all the patients who asked about Nozaki-san or inquired if she was working on a particular night would pass away within a couple of days. It was as if seeing her or talking about her was an incredibly ominous sign, signaling the approach of the end. It felt sinister, as if Nozaki-san were the hospital's grim reaper. As my aunt continued her story, I couldn't help but shudder at the eerie and unsettling turn of events. It made me reflect on the complexities of the supernatural world, and how perceptions of spirits could be both positive and chilling. It was a stark reminder that sometimes, even in seemingly heartwarming stories, there could be a dark undercurrent. When I was a child, my family used to go on vacation every year. We had relatives with a villa across the country, and we would spend our summers there. It was a time filled with joy, and I have many cherished memories from those vacations. I was about 10 or 11 years old when I had a disturbing experience one night at the villa deep in the mountains. There was no electricity in the area, and not many people were around. It was usually a great place for a relaxing summer getaway. On the fourth day of our annual stay, my parents decided to go to karaoke, but I was too tired from hiking in the mountains to join them. They promised I could get food there, which convinced me to stay behind. The karaoke place was located in the middle of a field halfway down the mountain pass. We spent about two hours there, and when I checked the clock, it read 11 p.m. I was struggling to keep my eyes open due to exhaustion. The karaoke room was very loud, but it was our private space with only my family present. My dad noticed my fatigue and seemed annoyed by my complaints. He suggested I go sleep in the car, and that idea appealed to me. He handed me the car keys, and I headed back to the car park alone. It was pitch dark outside, and I could hear the distant chirping of crickets. I got into our car, and strangely, I no longer felt sleepy. Instead, I was wide awake and bored. I picked up the flashlight we had in the car and began shining it around absent-mindedly. At one point, I directed the beam at another car parked next to ours, a car I hadn't noticed before. I aimed the flashlight at its windows and noticed a figure inside. I didn't want to be rude by shining the light directly into the person's eyes, so I moved it away and turned it off. I assumed my actions might have annoyed them. In an attempt to avoid trouble, like any kid would, I pretended to be asleep, keeping my eyes half closed. During this act, I sensed that the person in the neighboring car was looking in my direction. I couldn't see their face clearly, but I knew they were watching me. It made me nervous. Something felt off about the situation. I realized that the person in the car next to ours hadn't moved at all. It was as if a mannequin or a statue was sitting in the car. I was convinced it was a real person. 
it looked like a human. My eyes weren't playing tricks on me. A chill ran down my spine, and I became increasingly uncomfortable inside our car. I reached a decision. I needed to leave. But as soon as I decided to exit the car, the figure in the neighboring car slowly started turning its head to face me directly. Not moving its body, just its head. I was paralyzed, unable to move. It felt as if I were glued to my seat, and a sense of dread washed over me. As I sat in the car, my eyes gradually adjusted to the darkness, allowing me to make out the contours of the person in the car beside me. The head turned excruciatingly slowly, and the tension was unbearable. I remained frozen and unable to move. When the head had turned about halfway towards me, I felt my spine stiffen with a chilling sensation. The face of the person in the car was in a horrifying state, marred by raw red scars that were so pronounced they obscured the facial features. I couldn't discern the eyes or the nose, but those scarred features were seared into my memory. I focused all my energy on trying to run, but my body remained unresponsive. Sweat poured down my forehead, and tears welled up in the corners of my eyes. Yet I remained trapped. It felt like a nightmarish bout of sleep paralysis, except I was wide awake. At one point, I was convinced I was dreaming, repeatedly urging myself to wake up. But I couldn't. I couldn't wake up because this was real, and I wasn't asleep. I finally managed to close my eyes tightly, and I kept them shut for what felt like four or five minutes. When I opened my eyes again, I saw that scarred face still staring directly at me. That's the only memory I retained from that night. The haunting image of that scarred face peering at me. I was abruptly shaken awake by my dad, and I told him about the terrifying experience. He seemed to suspect that it was just a nightmare and didn't show much interest. However, I was convinced it had been real. I couldn't let it go, and I started making a commotion in the car park. It had been a traumatic experience for me, and I must have been in a distressed state. My mother went back to the karaoke place to inquire if anyone had been in the car park earlier. A few moments later, the owner of the establishment came out with my mother, a look of concern on her face. She knelt beside our car and cautiously asked me what the person had looked like. I sensed that she wanted to ensure there were no troublemakers in the area. Feeling the weight of the adult's expectations, I described the person in the car and mentioned the terrible red scars that covered their face. Unfortunately, the car had since left, so we couldn't determine the owner's identity. They asked me for any details I could recall, and my heart still raced as I tried to provide as much information as possible about the horrifying encounter. I continued to provide as much detail as possible about the person with the scarred face who had been in the car next to ours. I was so absorbed in recounting the encounter that I barely noticed the owner of the karaoke place breaking down in tears. She paused, cleared her throat, and spoke in a weak voice. She said, I think you saw my daughter. She took her own life right in this car park. She set her car alight and sat in there four years ago. The weight of her words hung heavily in the air we all fell into stunned silence. The owner of the karaoke place seemed to feel comfortable talking about what had happened. She went on to explain that her daughter had been mercilessly bullied at school for years. She had kept the bullying hidden from her family because she believed nothing could be done about it. In her despair, she had chosen a tragic path to escape her suffering. Hearing this heartbreaking revelation filled me with profound sadness. It was a crushing experience, and I could
couldn't shake the oppressive feeling of loneliness that weighed on me. Something the owner said jogged my memory, and suddenly I recalled a moment from before I had fainted. I remembered hearing a voice, and that memory would stay with me for the rest of my life. I heard only three words, three words that seemed to transcend time and connect the past to the present. Those words were, I hate them. I hoped that her daughter's soul could find peace and solace, finally free from the torment she had endured. Thank you for sharing your story. If you have any more stories, or if you need assistance with anything else in the future, feel free to reach out. Remember to take care and stay safe.